Welcome back from the very quick break. We're going to go ahead and get started with our next presenter under the building the capacity for resilience uh, section today. So if we could please be seated. Our next presenter is Stephanie Hornbeck. Stephanie is Director for Conservation of Karyatid Conservation Services and she will talk about developing an infrastructure for conservation and training in Haiti after the 2010 earthquake. Stephanie? Good morning, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be part of this um, important conference, and I'm really excited about the developments with um, the Cultural Recovery Center here that Corey's overseeing. Um, needless to say, projects like mine could have really benefited from this <laughs> five years ago, so this is really great for, for all of us. From 2010 to 2015, multifaceted efforts have been underway to build capacity to safeguard cultural heritage in Haiti after the devastating January 12, 2010 earthquake. That same year, the Smithsonian Institution Haiti Cultural Recovery Project was formed in partnership with the government of Haiti. This project evolved into a longer-term effort to develop cultural conservation there. Arising from discussions involving a network of international cultural organizations, our initial project coalesced into a concrete recovery effort consisting of 18 months of intensive activity followed by three and a half years of continued involvement, culminating in this year's inauguration of a purpose-built cultural conservation center at Kiskeya University, or the QCC, one of only two conservation centers in the Caribbean region. At the outset, we faced such serious challenges that the success of our mission seemed elusive. A combination of key variables turned our mission concept into a successful model of disaster recovery, and these included cross-cultural collaboration, commitment, infrastructure development, financing, training, and communication. Our project was unprecedented at the Smithsonian and remains its most ambitious cultural recovery mission to date. Today, I will present my on-the-ground perspective on developing a conservation infrastructure there. Haiti's earthquake yielded horrific humanitarian consequences. In 35 seconds, the 7.0 magnitude earthquake struck the greater Port-au-Prince region, killing an estimated 280,000 people and displacing 1.5 million others to tent cities. Destruction of built heritage and dramatic damage to public and private collections was widespread. With the dearth of heavy lifting equipment, collapsed ruins are still present throughout the city even five years later. This is a picture just from my trip last week. The acute humanitarian crisis required an immediate response. Addressing the cultural devastation was secondary, although deemed important by international cultural organizations. The Smithsonian Haiti Cultural Recovery Project was conceived as a collaborative international effort to provide expert assistance and operated in the Provisional Cultural Recovery Center in Port-au-Prince from June 2010 to March 2012. The Smithsonian partnered with the government of Haiti and other organizations to support the project mission to recover, stabilize, and conserve works of art, monuments, architectural features, and audiovisual materials damaged by the earthquake. Haitian cultural institutions established preservation priorities and foreign conservation experts supported them. Haitian professionals made all decisions regarding prioritization by cultural value and selected all works to be treated by the center. Understanding the objectives of our Haitian colleagues and communicating the purposes of our efforts were important to collaborative achievement of our shared mission. Numerous colleagues expressed their belief in the importance of protecting their cultural heritage, which they spoke about in terms reflecting a sense of national pride. An expression in Haiti states that its riches lie in its art. 
Among the islands of the Caribbean, Haiti is distinguished by an internationally recognized long history of visual arts creativity. This history comprises West and Central African cultural traditions, collectively termed voodoo, actively practiced since the 18th century, as well as colonial and post-colonial painting traditions. In the 1940s, Haitian art gained international recognition when the Centre d'Art was founded to provide remarkable self-taught artists from all over the island studios in Port-au-Prince. This period, known as the Haitian Renaissance, would produce such artists as Hector Hippolyte and Georges Liotteau and yield such national treasures as the famed New Testament mural cycle at Holy Trinity Episcopal Cathedral. Today, some contemporary artists have international reputations. Yet, despite this artistic tradition, in 2010, no systematic commitment to cultural conservation existed, several historic preservation efforts notwithstanding. So the ability of Haiti's culture professionals to respond to the severe damage from the earthquake sustained by tens of thousands of individual artworks, public monuments, and historic structures was inherently limited. Nevertheless, culture sector professionals recognized the critical need to recover the nation's patrimony while introducing Haitian art professionals to current collections care and art conservation practices in service to our mission. As we heard about during the Haiti panel last night, the conceptual foundation of the project was developed by Richard Curran, Undersecretary for History, Art, and Culture at the Smithsonian, in collaboration with the Haitian Ministries of Culture and Communication and Tourism. Corinne Wegener, then president of the U.S. Committee of the Blue Shield, and involved Errol Wentworth, executive director, and Eric Porchot, institutional advancement director at the American Institute for Conservation of Artistic and Historic Works, or the AIC. Our American partnership was formed as one part of a larger international effort. After several short assessment visits undertaken in the spring of 2010, former Minister of Culture Olson Jean Julien and I came on board as manager and chief conservator respectively when the project launched in June 2010. Working from the US, Wegener was con contracted as international project coordinator. Our project mission had to accommodate several parameters. First, the extensive damage to cultural heritage generally and collections specifically created a great need for specialized professional expertise. Second, an agreement between the government of Haiti and the Smithsonian fixed the project time period at 18 months. Third, the staffing model depended upon numerous participants serving for successive short periods. Last, a tight budget, $3,265,000 funded by American federal aid grant monies and private sector contributions, as you see here, imposed constraints on staffing and required careful consideration and prioritization of project needs. Recovery work is expensive and upfront and sustained financing are necessary. An important early decision determined that conservation work would happen in Haiti. A corollary decision involved incorporating Haitian professionals into conservation activities at every possible opportunity. After a major disaster, the chaos of widespread devastation renders collections vulnerable to theft or further deterioration. Even with good intentions, efforts to try to remove artworks for treatment by, for treatment by conservators abroad can create anxiety for local people who have seen their heritage, cultural heritage badly damaged only to fear its disappearance. Consequently, we decided to bring foreign expertise to Haiti to work collaboratively there. The overarching conservation challenge involved response to a cultural catastrophe, catastrophe of devastating proportions, while simultaneously building a local base of preservation and conservation professionals from the ground up. The damage sustained by tens of thousands of works posed advanced conservation projects, including torn, punctured, or broken paintings, badly torn or crumpled works on paper, broken, corroded, or deformed sculpture, and built heritage in total collapse. 
Furthermore, Haiti's tropical climate encourages biological degradation and infestation, aggressive agents of deterioration. A decades-long problem with electricity meant that even collections that had it and could provide air conditioning or fan power for air circulation could not provide it continuously. Many institutions did not have covered windows, allowing ingress of dust and pollution. Site visits to collections revealed that written and photographic collection inventories and basic collections care protocols were largely non-existent, even pre-earthquake. Similarly, most collections had not been prioritized to identify the most culturally important artworks. At the outset, I encountered misperceptions from colleagues about conservation, mainly an expectation of time-consuming, complete restoration of artworks. Although restoration is not a conservation priority when large volumes have been damaged in a disaster, it was the main aspect of repair work familiar to my Haitian colleagues. Establishing a multinational project that depended on Haitian partnerships required time to build relationships and trust. In 2004, Curran had worked with a number of Haitian colleagues to realize a program in, on Haiti for the Smithsonian's Folklife Festival. The existence of these already established relationships was integral to the success of our project and accelerated the necessary process of relationship building. A shared commitment by all participants to the project mission was essential and cultivated via the accessibility of project principles and constant communication to teach and share information. Communicating in the local language of French was critical to mutual understanding in the workplace and the sharing of information. From June until late August 2010, numerous meetings were held to lay the groundwork for the project. During this period, works were slow to arrive at the center and we worked to establish trust and explain our intentions. Throughout the project, we would hold weekly meetings with directors general from cultural organizations. Our team required both local culture professionals and foreign conservation experts. The center had a bilateral organizational structure with an administrative side to interface with local institutions comprised mainly of Haitians and an operational side to execute work, work activities made up of foreign conservators and eventually Haitian project assistants. A core staff of five Haitian colleagues under the direction of Julien staffed the CRC and covered the roles of office manager, registrar, training coordinator, administrative assistant, and contract project manager. Importantly, no recovery project can succeed without the commitment and participation of local professionals. I developed and directed conservation activities and supervised contract and volunteer conservators. 50 foreign conservators and collection managers participated in our project in staff, contract, and volunteer capacities. Contract conservator Viviana Dominguez oversaw painting conservation efforts. Three other contractors joined the project for several months at our busiest time. Volunteer professional conservators and collection managers came from the Smithsonian Institution and AIC. And small teams of two to three conservators at a time deployed for two-week periods. By the end of the project, volunteers contributed more than 400 work days. Most recovery efforts depend on volunteer participation. And our project was the first international recovery effort on this scale that AIC and its foundation supported. I worked closely with the volunteer coordinator to match specialties with our project needs. And our volunteer model worked adequately for a while, but required a time-consuming amount of oversight to orient people, and ultimately was insufficient for the large volume of works that came to the project. We selected a core of 13 Haitian conservation assistants, mostly college graduates with art or chemistry degrees, to support efforts on the ground and these assistants worked full-time at the CRC and received salaries. The Cultural Recovery Center, the CRC, was established in a former UN office complex in a gated compound. As seismically stable and adequately spacious work sites were at a premium after the earthquake, Smithsonian engineers vetted the center. 
The CRC consisted of a two-story building and large outdoor courtyard, and the building was divided into six office suites. Three were converted to serve as operational conservation studios. Two were devoted to office space and one to storage, and the courtyard accommodated the placement of 11 donated metal shipping containers used to store inorganic materials. The building had continuous electricity supported by generators at a quite expensive monthly fuel cost, but it enabled air conditioning, air sterilization, and electric fans for stable storage conditions for thousands of recovered mold-affected works. Obtaining local equipment and supplies was a significant challenge involving both a dearth of local suppliers and long delays. Large conservation projects at Holy Trinity, the Centre d'Art, and the Lehman Voodoo Collection all had difficulty obtaining wood, cardboard, hardware, fabric, and plastic. These delays regularly impacted operations and progress. Access to quality materials is essential for conservation, yet obtaining conservation-grade materials in Haiti was impossible. So 100% of these were imported, hand-carried by deploying conservators in more than 80 trips. Approximately $100,000 was spent on supplies. AIC placed the orders in tandem with deployments, and a single container shipment brought in large equipment like painting, easels, fume extraction, a donated vacuum table from the Library of Congress, and large rolled supplies. And eventually the studios were stocked with the necessary equipment. In the spring 2010 assessments provided an overview of conservation needs at institutions. I developed a comprehensive framework for the project's conservation objectives, which included outfitting and staffing conservation studios and development of our strategy. We needed a simple, practical, and adaptable conservation structure for the project that allowed for multiple levels of expertise from beginning assistant to experienced conservator, as well as the interchangeability of individuals. A, rapid volunteer, a volunteer model with rapid turnover meant that treatments were often started by one conservator and finished by another. Procedures and documentation had to be decipherable by multiple people, and equipment had to be user-friendly. Our conservation activities fell under four main scenarios, assessment and improvements to facilities, guidance and support of the recovery, and stabilization of damaged collections, treatment of a selection of culturally important and badly damaged works, and training to introduce concepts and practices. After assessment, stabilization measures such as vacuuming and treatment for mold were done. Improving storage conditions followed, a critical stage because works can remain stable under good conditions until further treatment. With advanced structural issues, treatment is extremely time consuming, and we referred to such damaged works as victims. Treatment was the last phase to be implemented, and at the center, approximately 115 works of art received this higher level of treatment, in part to assess the capacity in Haiti for advanced conservation. A training component to the project was crucial, as many colleagues had limited or non-existent exposure to contemporary preservation concepts, ethics, and practices. It was important to explain the need to first stabilize collections, then to prioritize works by cultural pri importance prior to treatment. We also had to correct detrimental practices in place by teaching that inaction, poor storage, and treatment with unstable materials can also cause damage. Our training objective was not to create conservators, which requires years of formal study, but to create technicians trained in service to the project mission, which was to process and stabilize a high volume of damaged artwork. Various training modules were offered at the CRC and included courses, workshops, and on-the-job practical experience at no cost to participants. In August 2010, the Smithsonian contracted the Rome-based International Center for the Study of Restoration and Preservation ECROM for a three-week course on first aid for collections, taught at the CRC for 24 local collection managers. 
an excellent course. It was customized for our specific context. Subsequently, eight workshops taught by Smithsonian or AIC conservators and collection managers were offered to support conservation activities. These included basic conservation of paintings, objects, paper, and audiovisual mater materials, and registration methods. Workshops were practical in concept and time to teach methods necessary for actual upcoming projects. More than 100 Haitian colleagues at cultural institutions around Port-au-Prince participated in at least one training session. We undertook three large multi-phase projects of six to 12 months. Thousands of artworks were inventoried, stabilized, and rehoused in improved storage conditions for both the internationally renowned Lehman Voodoo collection and the Centre d'Art collections. The stabilization and removal of the extant wall paintings at Holy Trinity Episcopal Cathedral represented our most important effort to safeguard built heritage. After the cathedral roof and walls collapsed, three murals remained of an original 14. The badly cracked murals were removed in sections and remain in a storage depot on site at the former cathedral. The recovery of the Centre d'Arts collection of nearly 5,000 paintings, sculpture, and works on paper represented the, larger, the largest conservation effort undertaken by our project. And all of the center's permanent staff, 15 conservators, two teams, and all of the ECROM training course participants worked to preserve this collection. After the collapse of the Centre d'Arts wooden gingerbread building, staff and artists worked tirelessly for more than 30 days to recover nearly 5,000 artworks directly from piles of rubble. These were stored in two large shipping containers on the street in front of the museum's site, protected by armed guards for eight months. On visiting the site several times, I noted the growth of mold and measured the humidity at 88%, and the collection was at grave risk. The Centre d'Arts Advisory Board recognized this, and in August 2010, the entire collection was transported to the CRC for processing stabilization and temporary secure storage. We developed a scope of work to stabilize the collection, and our methodology was tested in two case studies during the ECROM course. One study involved on-site work at the Centre d'Art, and for the, the site work, the UNESCO Cultural Heritage of, uh, Cultural Officer in Haiti arranged for a MINUSTA, United Nations Stabilization Mission in Haiti, Corps of Engineers to use a bulldozer and shovels to search for artwork still buried in the rubble. This effort marked the first time in Haiti that UN troops collaborated with local professionals to re help recover cultural material. And over a two-day period, ECROM instructors, conservators, and course participants, and the troops rescued about 150 works. The container case study was undertaken in the CRC's outdoor courtyard and at triage workstations. At course end, the protocol was shared with our um, Haitian project manager to adapt for work with his, her six-person team. And over nine months, assembly, assembly line processing of paintings, works on paper, and sculpture was underway. Because mold was such a significant issue, every team member wore personal protective equipment. Stabilized paintings and works on paper were stored indoors and metal works were stored in containers. A selection of 65 artworks were chosen by members of the Centre d'Art board to receive more intensive treatment by professional conservators. We built a new storage depot on the grounds of the Centre d'Art site to receive the stabilized collection, incorporating two shipping container, containers, shelving and flat files from the CRC. As a whole, the Cultural Recovery Project realized meaningful results, aiding 20 public and private institutions, including museums, galleries, and the National Library and Archives, in the stabilization of approximately 30,000 works of art 
books, documents, monuments, and wall paintings, and improvement to storage collections. Our project conservators achieved dramatic treatment results even while working in provisional studios far removed from a fully equipped conservation lab. These treatments preserve cultural patrimony for future generations and prove that advanced conservation work could be successfully achieved in Haiti. Our, con our successful conservation results inspired the establishment of the new Kiskeya Cultural Conservation Center where further in-depth treatments will be undertaken. Post-disaster cultural recovery typically requires a long-term investment to address damage because damage is both severe and widespread. In Haiti, perhaps a quarter century of work remains. The June 2015 inauguration of the purpose-built Kiskeya Cultural Conservation Center, designed by Olson Jean Julien, demonstrates a serious commitment to cultural heritage preservation in Haiti. Moreover, this center is the first francophone conservation center in the Caribbean and only the second center after Cuba in the region. Conservation is a specialized field that requires a long-term investment in training. And we are working to develop a training, a training module for the new conservation center at Kiskiya. A combination of continuing training in Haiti and offering opportunities for periodic professional internships abroad may be the solution. And since 2012, Yale University has offered conservation internships to pairs of Haitian interns to help treat a group of Haitian painted portraits. This internship project could be a model for others. The Smithsonian Institution Haiti Cultural Recovery Project is distinguished by its successful and pioneering cross-cultural international collaboration of experts who worked in common cause to protect Haitian patrimony damaged by the 2010 earthquake. Over time, our project surmounted challenges to realize meaningful conservation results. A reliance on previous relationships was crucial to forging collaboration and fostering commitment. An adaptable conservation operation structure served the project, allowing for multiple levels of expertise and interchangeability of individuals. An important focus on training taught necessary skills and created an atmosphere of learning appreciated by project participants. Haiti's new Kiskeya Cultural Conservation Center is poised to respond to the conservation needs of cultural organizations while forming Haiti's first generation of conservators. A multinational cultural recovery effort requires a significant team effort, and I wish to gratefully acknowledge and extend, and extend my thanks to colleagues in Haiti, at the Smithsonian, and at the AIC. I also wish to thank the many volunteers who joined our effort. Thank you. And I'd like to invite Eric Porchot, in Institutional Advancement Director from the AIC, to join me at the podium. Thank you. Um, the role of a discussant is a little, little strange in that you have to keep improvising as you hear more information and, and take more information in. Uh, so what I wanted to do really is pull some threads out uh, from Stephanie's presentation that might connect to things we heard yesterday and things we may be hearing later today and really looking at the work, the incredible work that the Smithsonian and, and especially that Stephanie was able to do under very difficult situations, look at that as a model and uh, see how that can be applied to other situations and uh, how it actually has already been applied in other situations. Uh, and I think going back to Terry Cannon's framework of disaster as social uh, is, is very interesting and very useful because we're used to thinking about disasters as that's an earthquake, that's a hurricane, that's a flood, and it requires certain tools and people and, and preparation, which is true, but as was pointed out, the response in Haiti was very different than, say, the response to Katrina. 
uh, or the response probably now in, in uh, uh, Nepal. And if, I suppose as Lori would say, not if, but when uh, the next earthquake hits in Haiti, the response will be very different because the situation will be very different. Uh, the preparation, the models, uh, the work we've already done would mean that you can't just take this as a cookie cutter and launch in and, and start all over again. So I think that, that uh, idea of tailoring each response to each situation is, is very important. Also important, I think, is that when this happened in 2010, the Smithsonian had no plan. FAIC really didn't have a plan. Uh, this was not something that we were prepared for. We didn't have a book on the shelf to say, this is how we're going to do this. Everything had to be created from scratch. And, um, but everything has been documented so well and presented publicly in several locations that when we were responding to Hurricane Sandy and we said, how are we going to deal with this? And we said, oh, a cultural recovery center. That would be a good idea. We've, we've seen that before. We couldn't duplicate what was done in Haiti, but it was a model that could be adapted to the situations uh, in, in the New York area. Um, an obvious point, but something that was brought up yesterday and, and brought up again today, the slow start, even once the center was up and running, uh, objects cannot come to get repaired. They don't walk by themselves. There's always that need to have that intermediary, the, the person and, or institution who is the custodian for those collections needs to be convinced and of course, first of all, needs to know that there is help available. So that communication that uh, uh, Stephanie was talking about, I think, is extremely important. Um, quick side, uh, but about collaboration, which has been talked about a lot yesterday and today. Uh, that sign that you've seen pictures of several times on the wall of the, the center, there are 14 different institutional logos on that sign. And if any of you work in an institution, you know that each one has a certain place you can put that logo, a certain way you word the title, a font. And so you just take that as one example of the ability to bring all these people together and agree on a sign, let alone on, uh, uh, on how to move forward. And it, it's an incredible, incredible undertaking. Um, I think infrastructure is, is a key point here. Um, there was certainly a lot of MacGruber, MacGyver improvisation. Uh, but I, I think one area that, certainly from FAIC's point of view, we, we never, I never felt we got right. And we had problems with it in almost every uh, uh, deployment we've done, is shipping. That you're dealing in you know, a chaotic situation, addresses are gone, UPS isn't running, customs and you know, uh, airplane, <coughs> restrictions on sizes, on flammable uh, materials. Um, and, and we need to figure a better way to do that. And uh, somebody had proposed uh, yesterday to me that uh, we really look at the military and are there ways that we can work with the military because they know how to do this. Um, the Red Cross or other NGOs who do a lot of uh, national and international work. Um, it's not something that's in my job description and in, in my knowledge base, uh, but we need to find a way to, to get that shipping down. And some, in each situation, as we're saying, is different. So with Hurricane Sandy, shipping wasn't the issue. The issue was everybody else was ordering N95 dust masks, so our usual suppliers didn't have them in stock anymore. So now we're looking for different suppliers who can get those uh, in, into the area that we need when we need them. Um, something that Stephanie didn't talk about, and maybe she doesn't want to talk about, uh, but, <laughs> but was housing. And uh, we used hotels uh, in, in Port-au-Prince for the volunteers, and then later they had um, some rented space. Um, and, and this is always an issue because, again, you're competing with everybody else, all the other relief agencies, the medical agencies, the housing uh, people, FEMA, if it's local, they've got all those hotel rooms booked, they've got the rental cars booked. Um, 
And, and this was an issue because we couldn't really surge anything. We couldn't bring in 20 people to work on a specific project. There was no place to house them. Plus you had to have transportation to get them from the housing to the, uh, uh, to the center. So that, that was a major logistic issue. And, and again, it's something that I think most emergency responses are going to, to come against. Um, funding was another element that Stephanie talked about. And even though there was a, a very generous amount of funding, it was not easy. And uh, NEA, NEH, IMLS were, were very supportive, but they don't really have a mechanism to just write you a check and hand it to you. Uh, you're still talking about 20 to 40 page proposals and uh, quarterly reports and, and so forth. So there's a lot of time consuming issue there. Um, later we were able to work under a contract with, with the Smithsonian and that uh, purchase order basically, which, which was much simpler to work with. Um, on the other hand, I think there's also the, the danger of the short attention span of trying to get funders now to support the QCC and its work. How do you sustain that? How do you maintain that five years after uh, the event? And so I think there's a, there's a real funding issue that needs, needs to be figured out as well, uh, short term and long term. Uh, the training, uh, you know, brilliant to uh, train the local people and they have the ability to continue this work after the 18 month project is over and, um, and building some curriculum through, through ICROM, through the work in Erbil that you hear about tomorrow. Uh, there are some wonderful curricula that have been developed uh, that can be adapted then for the various situations that may come up. Um, one of the things I know that Stephanie talked about yesterday was the, you know, the personal cost, the, the kind of emotional wear and tear of being in these situations. And even though I was safe in my office here in DC, uh, there were just days where it's like, oh, things are going so slowly. We're not doing what we need to be doing. How can we, how can I do anything here? And I, I think one of the things that I took some strength from was a figure that you have also seen on screen yesterday and today, that 18 months after the earthquake, there were still a million people uh, without homes from the original estimate of a million and a half. And so here you have international uh, relief organizations who have the capacity, they have the knowledge, they have the equipment, they even have the funding, and obviously they're struggling to, uh, to meet their goals too. So it, it helped put things in perspective. And then actually I thought, wow, this is going really well. <laughs> hey, thumbs up for us. Um, so it, it does take some patience and, you know, Hitoshi is there with his bag next to his door saying, when do I go, when do I go, when do I go? And we go, we don't have a place yet. We, and we don't have anything to work on yet, but we'll get there. Um, and, and then last, I just wanted to talk about personnel. Um, in, in two ways. I mean, obviously, as, as was pointed out, there's a limit to what volunteers can do. And we, we knew this, fortunately, helped with Sandy also, where that cultural recovery center we knew was going to be limited. We were aiming for three months because we just knew we could not sustain volunteers for, for longer than that. So we just had to, to do the work as, as best we could. But it does mean that you you know, this idea of surge and then the long-term work uh, is very difficult to balance. And similarly then with the, with the participating organizations, uh, I know I spoke with uh, the woman from ICROM and, and certainly with FAIC, we did not have any additional staff. You work with what you have, you just wear more hats. Um, you hire contractors uh, as best you can. Um, but it's, it's a very difficult thing to just go from zero to a program in, in, uh, with no time at all. And, and that's sort of where I wanted to leave my comments in that I think right now we have a real opportunity uh, with, with Corey and Lori and anybody else's name rhymed with that. Uh, 
uh, you know, here at the Smithsonian and, and Richard Curran's, you know, concept that he showed uh, last night of the, uh, the disaster, the emergency command center with the, the data coming in and the, the, uh, the work going out. Um, and then uh, we still have a, a full-time position with FAIC for emergency response now uh, uh, with Jessica Unger. And uh, these positions didn't exist in 2000. Well, they did. One existed in 2010. Lori, uh, Lori's position at, at Heritage Preservation was there. Uh, but we do have some opportunities, I think, now with some people who have emergency in their job title uh, to really use that as a core and to build from and not be starting totally from zero anymore. I've talked probably way more than enough. <laughs> I think we still have some time for questions. Oh, it was perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. That was wonderful. A really good compliment to what Hi, everybody. It's me again. Um, Hi, Hitoshi. Hi. <laughs> How are you? I was wondering, uh, all the uh, people are training at the center, are they became a full-time staff member or uh, what they are doing now? Um, I know some of them came to this country. Like I, think, um, I think they're the one who went to Iowa somewhere. I, I read about it, but um, I'm just wondering, are they uh, stay with Haiti or they are exploring going to Europe or this country? Um, well, various people are doing various things because there's been a, a gap of, um, well, it, it's now over three years between the recovery mission and the new center. Um, for about a year, our, our assistants all participated in a, uh, a new collections management course offered at Kiskiya University. And so we were able to sort of retain them in the collections management sector for a little while. Um, we also, at that time, established the internship program with Yale, and we've sent, I think, at this point, six pair, um, sorry, three pairs of people to that project. Um, all of this was happening while the new center was, you know, we were negotiating where to build it and all of that. Um, so there was no place. Our, our center and our, our CRC was a provisional rented space that we had. So we had no place for people. Um, and now we do, but this time has elapsed. So some of the people have taken advantage of opportunities abroad, um, in France, in Canada, in Brazil. So um, that has happened. Most of them have remained in Haiti. And at this point, um, three to four of our original assistants are working with us to establish our new center. Um, and going from that, we hope to certainly offer training to more people. But as for like a salaried position, we, we are only able to offer three to four positions right now. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Sharon Park, Historic Preservation for the Smithsonian. I have a question about contemporary artists. Were you able to engage with any of the uh, artists whose work uh, is, is today or 10 years ago or five years ago to provide lab space or any space for them to come in and work on their own uh, restoration of their art or to facilitate? Uh, what was the relationship, not the wonderful work you were doing in training um, assistants to come in, but was the local art community um, interested in being engaged with this recovery process? Um, by and large, we, we did not have much of a relationship with contemporary artists um, in Haiti. I did meet several of them just um, on my many visits there, um, but we were not offering um, studio space to them specifically. The Smithsonian did at one point, soon after the earthquake, collect artist materials and purchase art artist materials, donated artist materials that were sent down to Haiti. And um, that was, I believe, distributed through UNESCO 
And UNESCO did have several programs with contemporary artists. Um, I, I don't know that it involved really conservation, but it was helping them to have studio space and materials to, to create art. And because that's their livelihood, of course. You know, if they're not making, producing art, they may not be getting any sort of income. So um, that was an important question, but others from our, not our project were, were addressing that. Anybody else? 